like to introduce our scholar for today, Dr. John Patrick Gray. Come on up. He teaches dramatic writing sequence at UGA and serves as a resident playwright with Rising Sun Performance Company in New York City. Most recently, John oversaw Playwrights Festival, an event co-sponsored by the Rose of Athens Theater, an Athens Playwright Workshop. John is currently developing two plays and two essays, so let's wel welcome John to the stage. Hello there. Uh, often scholarly means boring. <laughs> so I wrote out my speech for the sake of brevity. You're welcome. <laughs> In New Playwriting Strategies, Language and Media in the 21st Century, Paul Castaño devotes some time to discussing the ways in which playwrights have adapted known stories, histories, and cultural memories into new works for the stage. In particular, Castaño is interested in how playwrights can create works out of objects of cultural memory, or his word, stuff. In his section on hybrid stuff, Castaño points to playwright and teacher Mac Wellman, a great playwright whose titles I can't say out loud in mixed company, um, who pushes students to look outside of themselves to, quote, see what's in the newspaper in order to stimulate their imagination and create new works. A number of plays have emerged in recent years that use this hybrid approach. Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, a rock and roll show based on Jackson as controversial American president. Spring Awakening, a rock and roll adaptation of the censored 1893 Vatican play. You might see a theme here. Um, and Hamilton, Lynn manuel Miranda's hip-hop take on the work and death of Alexander Hamilton, which is about to move to Broadway from the public theater. There are a number of other examples, but for the sake of brevity, I'll keep the list short. These works present relevant topics by reimagining key figures from our past. Today, we are going to listen to In Time for the Postman, an adaptation of Caroline Henderson's Letters from the Dust Bowl, uh, written between 1931 and 1937 and published in Atlantic Monthly. Born into a wealthy Iowa farm family, Caroline Boa was educated at Mount Holyoke College where she earned a degree in literature. In 1907, she moved to the Oklahoma Panhandle to fulfill her dream of living in the American wilderness. She became a teacher at a Texas school, and in 1908, she married farmer and cowboy Will Henderson, whom she hired to dig a well. They built their farm in Eva, Oklahoma, where Caroline Henderson remained, more or less, until her death in 1966. The Dust Bowl, um, which was a result of severe droughts, dust storms, and lack of erosion prevention and farming techniques, hit the U.S. prairie in three waves in the 1930s. In her letters, Henderson gives a first-hand account of how a large section of our country and Canada had been baked into clay during the drought and how some farmers tried to carry on. Here is a section of one of her letters to a friend named Evelyn, dated June 1935. Quote, a fairly promising piece of barley has been destroyed for us by the mirrorless drift from the same field whose sands have practically buried the little mulberry hedge which has long sheltered our buildings from the northwest winds. Large spaces in our pastures are entirely bare in spite of the rains. Most of the green color, where there is any grazing, is due to the pestilent Russian thistles rather than to grass. Our little locust grove, which we cherished for so many years, has become a small pile of fence posts. With trees and vines and flowers all around you, you can't imagine how I miss that little green shaded spot in the midst of the desert glare. Naturally, you will, under, you will wonder why we stay where conditions are so extremely disheartening. Why not pick up and leave as so many others have done? It is a fair question, but a hard one to answer. But she tries to give an answer. Quote, to leave voluntarily, to break all these closely knit ties for the sake of a possibly greater comfort elsewhere seems like defaulting on our task. We may have to leave. We can't hold out indefinitely without some return from the land, some source of income, however small. But I think I can never go willingly or without pain that as yet seems unendurable. End quote. Scholars of cultural memory have argued that our identities are marked by the places we live, 
the daily rituals we perform, and the stuff that we hold dear. It is our shared history that gives us a sense of cultural memory, and part of that history is uh, our land. As I mentioned, we are about to experience an animated stage reading um, of a play that is adapted from the letters of Caroline Henderson. And let's have some vocabulary real quick. A stage reading involves actors with script in hand, sometimes at music stands, sometimes standing, sometimes sitting. But here, the actors may have access to the scripts, but they will also have costumes and props and some movement. An animated stage reading is not unlike a workshop production in this respect. The playwright is Philip Gerson, who, like me, graduated with his MFA from the New School. I like him already, <laughs> even though he could not join us today. <laughs> Nevertheless, I am truly glad that Gerson has given us the opportunity to hear his work, performed by our excellent Athens actors, whom I have been proud to work with on a number of stage readings through the Rose of Athens No Shame Play Reading Series. Thank you all for attending today, and now here is In Time for the Postman. today, just like it was yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. You know, before the dust storm started, <laughs> you know, it seems like these days the majority of my sentences begin with before the dust storm started, like, um, like, before the dust storm started, we had families moving into this area on a regular basis. Or, uh, before the dust storm started, uh, the radio station was still in business. Or, before the dust storm started, I could get from my counter to my kitchen table without getting dust in my cereal bowl. <laughs> and you see, a dust storm, well, it isn't like a regular storm. One storm only perpetuates the next and makes it even worse. It's a combination of perils. See, you got the, the drought, you got the extreme heat, and you got the high winds all working together, creating these gigantic rollers shooting up into the sky like a rocket ship. And sometimes they don't stop until they get as far as the Atlantic Ocean, and they just ain't got nowhere to go. The Dust Bowl, the Dirty Thirties, whatever you want to call it. I just call it hard times out here in no man's land. Well, like I said, this bag may not be as well fed as it once was, but I can guarantee, without a doubt, I'm going to have some incoming and outgoing mail for the Henderson family down the road. For Caroline Henderson, the mail does not stop. Now, this might be my personal opinion, but uh, Caroline and her husband, Will, mm, they're kind of considered the oddballs around these parts. <laughs> well, at least amongst those of us who have stuck around. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's how educated Caroline is or her discontent with the Brethren Church that we all go to on Sunday mornings. I don't know. Well, like I said, I don't have a problem with her. Not at all. In fact, I might not have a job if it weren't for all the, all the articles she writes and the letters she sends out. I've seen them in the Daily Farmer. She started in the ladies' world, and that was just because the Hendersons were desperate for cash. <clears throat> in fact, I've got something right here she's surely going to want to take a look at. Woo! I do love <sighs> seeing her eyes light up when I hand her one of these. It makes the dust disappear for just a moment. <coughs> Since I wrote
owe to you. We have had several bad days of wind and dust. On the worst one recently, old sheets stretched over door and window openings and sprayed with kerosene quickly became black and helped a little to keep down the irritating dust in our living rooms. Nothing that you see or hear or read will be likely to exaggerate the physical discomfort oh, or material losses due to these storms. Less emphasis is usually given to the mental effect, the confusion of mind resulting from the overthrow of all plans for improvement <coughs> or normal farm work and the difficulty of making other plans even in a tentative way. To give just one specific example, the paint has been literally scoured from our buildings by the storms of this uh, <laughs> and previous years. We should by all means try to save the surface, but who knows when we might safely undertake such a project. The pleasantest morning may be a prelude to an afternoon when the dust devils all unite in one hideous onslaught. <laughs> the combination of fresh paint with a real dust storm is not pleasing to contemplate. In 1936, still remain extremely doubtful. There has been no moisture of any kind since the light snow of early January on a 70 mile drive yesterday. Oh. <laughs> there you are. What do you mean? I was wondering when you were going to get here. At my usual time, when else? <laughs> well, I guess you're just a little bit late. I'm a busy, busy man, Mrs. Henderson, you know that. Charlie, what I think keeps you busy is telling bad jokes. <laughs> well, I apologize, Mrs. Henderson. Don't apologize. Keep doing it. I could use some smiles and a good laugh. I think we all could. I'll keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. So, did you see uh, the paper on Sunday? I did. <clears throat> well, what did you think of that? <laughs> the shampoo sale at the five and die. <laughs> no. No, the notices about the foreclosure proceedings. Well, and the sheriff's sales. What I didn't realize is that it was referring to one of the homes that was on my route. Oh, why do you say that? Now, what do you suppose I'm supposed to do with these? Well, what's all that? You know the Callahan family? Oh, Bill and Anna down the road well, in Eastridge? They were down the road. Uh, if I was a moment late, which I don't think I was, it was because I was sitting on their front porch, dumbfounded. Couldn't take my eyes off the... Notice on the front door. Place was completely abandoned. Oh, I wonder where they went. Well, they better let someone know if they want to see their mail, because I'm sure not going to be the one to go out of my way to find them. Boy, I'm getting tired of hearing the same story. Yeah, you're not the only one. You know, before the dust storms, I... <laughs> Charlie. Yeah. As I was saying, before the dust storms, we had a deal with the land. A wonderful agreement. You remember that. We dig our fingertips into the soft soil and care for it with our hands day in and day out. And it would give back tenfold. Now it's just dry dirt going to the hands of banks and mortgage companies. We're into the sky. Exactly. Richard Andrews, you know him? I believe so. Not well, but we've met. Well, he told me they sold all their crops and they only had $12 left over for seeds, labor, drilling, and marketing. So what I heard was they took his false teeth 
because he couldn't afford to pay for them. No! That's what I heard. Oh, you know, you know the Nelsons. Yeah, they left a few months ago, didn't they? Yeah, you well, know, almost without saying a word. We've been friends for a long time, you know. I think, well, I know most people around here might think of me as a little <laughs> peculiar. Oh, now no one thinks that. <laughs> Whatever you say, Charlie. Anyway, the night before they left, I saw them packing up their truck. They weren't planning on saying goodbye to anyone after being here all that time. You know how long it took them to raise wheat here five years, toiling, long days of laborious work. But it didn't matter. They were smart, too. Wheat's a dependable crop. They had some health problems, his wife, but those those crops were continually short. Oh, they lost all that land, all that stock. And then the government refused to give them a loan to buy some cattle. Where'd they go? They told me they were headed for Texas. They didn't want to make the same mistakes. They wanted to start over. I, I wish them my best. I didn't know what else to say. Well, they drilled a pretty good well, though, didn't they? That's right. And you know what? Give it three weeks. Whatever bank gets a hold of that now deserted homestead is going to try to sell that pipe coming from that well. You really think so? No, of course I do. And, well, in my opinion, that's just unpardonable. We need some water. We all do. At this point, if my lettuce bed doesn't get some water, there will be no lettuce bed. You know, the other day we had to we had to take the Model T out to a low pool in the south pasture with green cans. That's smart. That, can you believe that? Well, don't you have a windmill pumping water? Barely. And that's all we've got. Listen, I, I could go on and on about this stuff forever, but it's not going to get us any more water. In fact, it's not going to get us anywhere. So anyway. So what are you working on, Caroline? Oh, you know me, Charlie. <laughs> An article? Well, it, it's a letter. A letter to my friend, my colleague, Evelyn Harris. Uh, some of our work has been placed into the Atlantic Monthly. Oh, that's a big publication. Sure, but it's just one of our goals. But ultimately, over time, we've become close friends, corresponding with a shared sense of sympathy, you know. She's interested in my life out here, and I'm likewise interested in hers. And where does she live? Oh, she lives in Maryland. She's managing three farms all on her own. Wow. Yeah, she says it wasn't so impossible until the Depression came along. I just wish I could provide her with some positive news, but, well... <sighs> So I, get, I assume you're not sending that one today? No, but I, I do have a couple for you. Let me grab them. Uh, all right. Here you are, my good man. And let's see what we got here. Uh, one is to my friend Rose. Yeah, I recognize that name. Oh, I've known her and her mother since my days in Des Moines. And the other one is to the same address? That's her mother. Oh, I see. I thought it'd be best to give them each their own letter. It seemed most proper. You know what I mean. Yeah, I think you might be the only person I know who would do something like that. And is that a bad thing? No, no, absolutely not. Well, bless you. And all right, I'll get this sent out to you by tomorrow morning. But Charlie. Yes? You got anything for me? Oh, all right. <laughs> all right, I almost forgot. Yes. So let's see, let's see, here we go. Anything good? Just two bills, not especially fun. I might wait till tomorrow to show these to Will. How's he doing? I apologize, I forgot to ask. Oh, he's actually out back working on that windmill, seeing if he can get it to turn a little bit faster, be more useful. He's been out there all day. We're about to sit down for supper and have a break soon. Well, tell him I said hello, please. We will do. So that's it? What do you mean? Are you sure nothing else came for me? Well, let me check. Uh, Oh. Oh, well, what do you know? Look oh. at that. Sorry about that. And there's 
that smile. That's what I like to see. Oh. <laughs> you kid around too much, Charlie. Well, I'll, you know see, that. I'll see you tomorrow, Mrs. Henderson. You take care. Be safe. Today may not be that day, but don't worry, we'll, we'll take care of it. You just rest. You need a break. Caroline, the windmill stopped pumping water. What do you mean? I mean, the jet rod's rising and falling, but not a drop of water's coming out. I don't understand. When did that happen? When I went out there this morning, the pump leading to the water barrel wasn't even damp. When you went out there this morning? Yes, but we all... Why didn't you tell me? Because I didn't want to worry you. Well, now I'm worried. Well, I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. I just... So at this moment, we have no water for this house, for the stock. I need to pull out some more tools. Like what? Like chains, wrenches, pump leathers. we got to figure out what's causing the problem. Let me come out and help you. No, that's OK. What do you mean? I mean, I've got it under control. Well, it doesn't sound like it. Let's, let's go look at it. Here, it's dark now. What are you talking about? We've got a good hour left. Caroline, I'm still not even sure what the source of the problem even is. That's what we are going to find out. Do we need to raise the plunge rod? Uh, you know how hard that is? <laughs> we need some reliable tools. That's what I said. There might be some metal wedge under that bow. You really think that's what it is? I, it could be. I don't know. I haven't looked at it yet, Will. That's why I want to go out there. As you mentioned, we're running out of daylight. Well, we're going to have to pull up the pipe if we're going to actually see what's going on. And how are we going to do that? Well, we'll have to call somebody over here to give us a hand. And who's going to do that? That's difficult and dangerous. And no one comes around here. Charlie does, but that's because he has to. I don't know, Caroline. Maybe there's some kindness left in the air with all this dust. You know, I want that to be the case. I really do. But we're probably going to have to hire someone to pull up that pipe. As you well know, we don't exactly have the funds for that right now. I don't know what else to say. I don't know any other way we're going to figure out the source of the problem. I really did not think things could get any worse. I, I didn't think that was possible. And it was kind of a relieving thought. Can you believe it? But here we go. Here we go, it's getting hotter and hotter every day. We got no rain. All we got is heat and dust, which reminds me. Well, it's gotta be one of three things. That's what I'm thinking. Either the pipe rusted through. Oh, let's hope not. It could be a crack in the cylinder. Oh, look at this, look at it. Or some change in the condition. Something with the mud, the sand, something's hindering the action of the valves. It's getting to the point where this is normal. That's what scares me. What? This, we're just supposed to accept this as an aspect of our home? The dust on the floor? <laughs> yes, this silk-like deposit that doesn't seem to want to go anywhere. Well, let me help you. No, well, there's... It's okay. Come on, please. There's only one broom, Will. I guess I'll just stand here. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do for dinner. Figure something out. Well, my potatoes, they've been set back tremendously. My field peas are gone. Most of my chickens have been beat down into the earth. And the wheat has been torn to pieces. And now, well, we don't have any water. 70% of the earth, and we don't have any of it. Caroline. Uh, well, I, I think 
I just need um, a minute. I want to help. I know. You sure? <laughs> yeah, I'll be in and, and uh, cook dinner in just a minute. Take your time. I'll be in the other room if you need me. I got your letter this morning just as we were starting to go to church, and I was so glad to have it. We went to the congregational church this morning, but didn't care for it this time. They had a beautiful pot of those blue flowers in big clusters as big as grapefruit and had five of those bunches on it, I think. I can't think of what it is. I wish I had it. I wish you could have had dinner with us today. I got a gallon can of pineapple yesterday. I got so hungry for it, and I canned what was left into three pint cans and made jello out of a few pieces. And I put in some pieces of the last of the pears you canned, and it was awfully good. August is cracking some nuts now. There are still some pecans left. I wish you could be here when we start to pack up. We have had the most lovely music all day. There has been a symphony or an opera about all day. Have you heard a story yet about Das Rheinbow? The Met Opera Company played it yesterday, and <coughs> and August and I debated about an hour about what it was, and I was sure it was that. And when they got through and announced what it was, that was it. So I felt rather proud of myself. I never can remember the name of anything like that, though I may know after one time that I have heard it before and know what is coming next and try and remember that name, and that makes me so mad. <laughs> Those stories you sent about the Wagnerian operas are very good. I enjoy them. Well, I have to get downstairs in time for the postman who comes along before 9 o'clock. I'll write again Monday, and August said to tell you he'd be, we would all be coming around the mountain before you knew it. Be sure to let Father know. We look Caroline, forward to seeing Caroline. you. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no. Time. no, come in. I want to talk to you. You sure? Yes, please. I'm sorry if I seemed unreasonable earlier. Oh. I was just frustrated. I am frustrated. I want to be able to come through for you. You do, Will. You do. And... Uh, if I ever made you feel like that is not the case. It's not you. I just don't understand how much bad luck two people can have. You know what I mean? Do you want some pears? What? Do you want some pears? Pears? Pears. I believe we still have one can of pears left from a few months ago. I could heat up that jackrabbit stew and biscuits from the other night, and that should fill us up for the night. That sounds great. <sighs> what can I do to help? Will you please go over to Jacob's farm and ask him to come over here first thing in the morning? To help us pull up the pipe out back? Remember how we loaned him our horses when yeah. his tractor broke? Yeah. Hopefully he will too. Well, if he can bring his truck over here in the morning, we can tie on the rope and pull it up that way. That's dangerous work, Caroline. What else can we do? There's that is the only way that we can unscrew the joints and fully examine the situation. If a portion of the pipe needs to be replaced, we need to get on it as soon as possible. Let's just hope the wind keeps blowing, because if, if it stops, we have got nothing. Hmm. Well, it's going to rain again, isn't it? Uh, I, it's a little little drops at some point are going to start falling from the sky. I, I can't tell you when that's going to happen, but I promise it will. It will. It has to happen eventually, right? You remember what it used to sound like? Oh, uh, maybe if I try hard enough. Middle of the night, little tiny droplets ricocheting off the shingles on the roof. I can see it. I can hear it. Well, that's what I try to hear when I can't go to sleep. Breathing in all that dust, 
find it in my nose nostrils when I wake up in the morning? Oh, it's true. No. no, you forget about those gentle drops. It's those storms that I loved. It's the storms turning the farm into a, a uh, temporary surprise. Happy little lake for the ducks. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I'm going to go into the kitchen right now and make dinner. And uh, it'll be ready before you know it. All right. Oh. I'm going to go to Jacob's. Hopefully, Jake will be in a good mood and we can get this thing figured out first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, that's all we can hope for. You'd be safe driving. Okay. Farmers are an interesting breed. They have to be hopeful in some way. They don't really have a choice. In spite of failure and loss, well, they just, they just keep working day after day. They were trained to face hard facts from the get-go. They have to adapt and produce their own necessities for life, things that you need for survival. Because when you get right down to it, well, what else is there? <laughs> well, hello there. How you doing? On time. I'm always on time, Mrs. Henderson. We've been through this. Uh, yeah. Ooh, what you been doing? You look like you've been outside. Oh, yes. Will and I, you know Jacob from next door. Of course I do. We've been working on the pipe outside since early this morning. Is that right? What's wrong with it? Well, we found some rotting wood under the valve. Oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Jacob thinks we'll be able to get it up by, by sundown. Which I hope is the case because we need water, even if it's just one glass to share for the night. You got any letters for me to send today? Oh, I, I, I have one for Evelyn. Thought you would have already written a brand new one for your daughter. No, I'll work on that one tonight. How is she doing? Eleanor? Yeah, she's got her own family now, doesn't she? Oh, well, she got married last year. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Oh, Charlie, it was a small affair. You know, I can't even remember the last time I saw her. Well, fear not. She should be here visiting soon enough, which reminds me I need to wash the curtains over her bed when we have enough water, which will hopefully be soon. Well, I must say, Mrs. Henderson, given your situation... Our what... situation. We... Could all use some water, right? Well, given our situation, you sure do seem to be in high spirits today. Oh, well, uh, you think so? <laughs> I guess somehow, sometimes, the edge of a cloud can turn before you know it. Has it turned? Well, maybe it budged just an inch. The conditions haven't changed, have they? No. But somehow things look slightly different. Is that why people love letters so much? Sure. It's a piece of tangible compassion. It gives one something to look forward to. Well, I certainly support the custom wholeheartedly. <laughs> which makes sense. <laughs> How else could I be able to keep up with my daughter's life, which I can sure assure you is much more exciting than my own. Now, she's still in school. Uh, she's finishing her degree now. Well, that's good to hear. Please congratulate her for me. I told you, Charlie, you'll be able to do it soon enough yourself. You know, I am I'm so proud of her. As you should be. There's not a lot of women in medicine today. There should be, but there's not. So I just have to be proud. <laughs> I'm going to be the mother of one of those few esteemed lady doctors. Well, you should get her to move back here and start her own practice. Are you out of your mind? Uh, I don't want this for my daughter. This degenerating land, this dirt. I want the opposite of this tragedy for her. Will and I are pouring ourselves into this land so that we can find a better, more promising place so that she can find that place of her own for her home, for her future. Besides, 
She still has a lot of work to do on the campus and one of the laboratories there. Yeah, and how does she like that? Oh, she loves it. She's working with microscope slides in the anatomy lab. She told me about this, this project they have on campus. Picture this. Okay. Close your eyes. It'll help. Trust me. Well, why not? It's on the slope on the south side of the campus. Overlooking a broad valley, there is a plot of land that's never been touched by a plow or a tractor or a spade. Can you see it? I don't think I can remember when land looked like that. Oh, tall green grass, wild roses, geraniums. And with each spring, the plot only grows more green and more lush. Do you know what I'm talking about? Please continue. Okay. Uh, well, oh, the alumni named it the Prairie Acre. They marked it with a tablet made of the native limestone. No one is going to touch that land, Charlie. No one. It's, it's something they just leave alone. It's simple. It's natural beauty. What better time than now to start a project like that? Exactly. You can open up your eyes now. <laughs> Do I have to? <laughs> You know what I like about it, Charlie. Everything. <laughs> you know, it's just so rare. So rare nowadays that, that folks understand that feeling. You know what I mean? What feeling is that, Mrs. Henderson? Well, that primitive feeling. That kinship with the earth that it's difficult to define. It's uh, a common mother that we all share. You see, as Christian or Unitarian or whatever religion it is that you associate yourself, we're all pagan enough to, to have an instinctive love for the earth. Why else would we put ourselves through all this? Well, with any luck, the folks over in Washington are going to get the word and they're going to send us some help. Oh, well, I, I hope they understand that agricultural recovery doesn't happen overnight. It is a slow, slow process. It's, it's all about planning. It's about taking the, the initiative to meet local conditions. And to make that happen, to get that kind of support, that financial support we are talking about, we're talking about that common welfare, the common welfare for everybody, not just farmers, but for everyone in need of support. I don't know. It sounds like some socialistic words you're speaking there, Mrs. Henderson. I'm not afraid of socialism. <laughs> a lot of the progressive legislation I've been reading about could be considered socialistic in some way, right? Well, I suppose you're right. Mm. Well, don't worry, I'll just stop rambling now. But I must ask, do you have anything for me? Well, I, I believe I do, actually. Oh. <laughs> well, look at that. Washington, D.C. Washington? And who do you know in our nation's capital? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being nosy. Oh, no, believe me, I, I, I don't know, but I would tell you if I knew. Well, have fun with that. I guess I'll see you the same time, same place tomorrow. Mm. Look forward to see what you got for me, as always. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. Uh, here you go. Oh, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Hey, Caroline. Yeah. Can I ask you something? Shoot. Why do we stay here? Do you ever think about that? Why don't we just do what the Nelsons did? I think about that. I think about that all the time. Uh, I just can't pretend like all I've been putting into this farm for the last 27 years has been for naught. Leaving for greater comfort seems like it would be defaulting to the task, right? I want those, those birds to set up shop again. I want those trees 
chasing wildflowers back. At least for others, if not for ourselves. Good luck with pie. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, Charlie, be safe. letter was from none other than Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace. He wanted to personally praise Caroline for her contribution to the, as he said, the American understanding of some of our farm problems and the courage with which our farmers are meeting them. It's Caroline's writings that provided the much-needed first-hand account of the struggle for survival that those farmers were going through. Not only that, her writings also reflected the effectiveness of President Franklin's New Deal programs, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, for example, offering drought relief and agricultural price stabilization did eventually help. The Dust Bowl came to a close at the start of 1940s. We got some record-breaking precipitation in 1941, if you can believe that. <laughs> then came the war, and the boom after the war, and then prices for crops were reasonable again. I don't think Caroline ever fully recovered, though. As much as I wish that were not the case. I think she felt a sense of failure. She wasn't even aware of the pride that she should feel for the merit of her writings or the effect it had on her readers. She was sure proud of Eleanor, though. Her daughter went on to do research on an anesthetic, and eventually she did start her own private practice. And I can tell you firsthand, she cherished every letter she received from her daughter. And that never changed, not a bit. And just like with Eleanor, Caroline's love and commitment for the land remained impenetrable. Oh, her and Will, they talked about alternatives to keeping the farm, but they knew they could never walk away from what they had built. Others just kept giving up. But not them. Not the Hendersons. Where else would they find a sense of purpose? What would be the point of leaving Oklahoma's high plains? <laughs> so before the dust storm started, <laughs> darn it, <laughs> before the dust storm started and after they subsided, Caroline Henderson, until her death in 1966, used her love for the land to inspire people to not give up even in the worst of times. And no matter what, yeah. her writings will always serve that invaluable purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to see what she's got for me tomorrow. <laughs>